I learned something from my father in the faith. I hope I learned a lot of things. But one of the things he used to say, and I used to think it was kind of funny, he'd say, my messages are like boxcars. He said, they can be joined together or stand alone. And so I try to make all of my messages stand alone messages, but at the same time, when I'm on a theme, I like to hook them together. So let's just kind of do that this morning, because some of you may have been on vacation, and now a lot of you are back in school, and some are gone this weekend, but next weekend, everybody will be here, but we're going to catch up. Can you say amen? So when Moses was told by the Lord that he wanted him to go visit the children of Israel, his brethren, Moses' question to the Lord was, whom shall I say sent me? And God said, you tell them that I am that I am has sent you. I want everybody to say God is present tense. Is present tense. He, is he is now. He is the great I am. He is See Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was yesterday he still is today. How many of you have ever had God come through for you? What He was yesterday, whatever He did for you in the past, He still will do today. Can you say amen? And whatever He'll do for you today, He'll still be the God of tomorrow. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the God who changes not. Hallelujah. If He ever did it, He'll do it again. Praise God. Can you say amen? If he ever turned loaves and fishes into multiplication, he's capable of doing it again. If he ever caused somebody's shoes not to wear out, he's capable of doing it again. If he ever parted the Red Sea, he's capable of doing it again. If he ever opened River Jordan, he's capable of doing it again. Whatever God ever has done, if he ever walked into the fire with three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fourth man, he'll still walk back in the fire and it won't touch you, it won't burn you, it won't harm you because he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Say this with me. Whatever God was, He still is. And whatever He is, He still will be. And say this with me. He is great today. So many people live in the past. Historians can't see who, who God is today by spending all their time on what He was yesterday. Prophetic teachers, sometimes I would like to say pathetic teachers, but no, some prophetic teachers are excellent. They do excellent, but all of their focus is on the future. And I'm just very concerned that when we focus in the past and in the future, we're missing the God of today. It really troubles me that when the Lord moves, we wonder what He's going to do next. Why can't we slow down and enjoy the moment? What if you ladies cooked a great meal in your family and they started, before that meal was ever over, they started saying, what are you going to do to top this? What are you going to do to top this? Not anything. I'm still going to give you steak or hamburger and beans and whatever it was I gave you last week. I'm still going to give you some more of that this week. Spaghetti or whatever it is. It's just going to keep giving you. I'm going to keep right on feeding you. Hallelujah. There may be treats along the way, but I'm going to keep right on feeding you every day, day in and day out. Can you say amen? Say out loud, just like God, I'm going to keep feeding them and I want them to appreciate today. I think sometimes we're yet that way with God. And we need to be appreciative and thankful because He knows what's best. If an answer coming to you is delayed on God's end, It's perfect timing when it comes. Now, faith for us is right now. We're not believing for the future, but the manifestation may be in the future. We're believing God right now. And this is where we get in trouble. If we always stay on God's going to, God's going to, well, how can he today if you believe he's going to tomorrow? He is the God of yesterday. He is the God of tomorrow, but he is the God of today. Can you say amen? I want us to really get that because I think it's very important that we get a fresh revelation. That's how the Lord's been dealing with me, uh, just a fresh revelation of what He'll do for you now. How many of you need God to do something for you now? 
You know, let's say you had terminal cancer and you have three months to live, but God's not going to come through until you a year from now. That wouldn't be much good, would it? We need to believe in the God of today, right now. Whatever he did yesterday, he'll do right now. Hallelujah. And he'll still be doing it tomorrow. Now notice this. We're going to pick up now and go forward. The psalmist. I want you to turn over to Psalm 46 for a moment. The psalmist said this in Psalm 46, just verse 1 for right now. God is our refuge and strength. Now notice, a very present help in trouble. I want everybody to say present help. The famed preacher Martin Luther, the great reformer, was going through a very difficult time in his life. He had a week of what he said was hell, and it seemed like God was nowhere around. How many of you have ever been like that? You know, he always is around. He just doesn't always reveal himself. How many of you know he's around? When, when you're going through something and it doesn't feel like God's around, that's a perfect opportunity for you to walk by faith and not by feeling. You see, when we feel God, it's easy. When we sense the presence of God, it's easy. But we're in the middle of something going on in our lives, and we feel nothing. It's as if we pray in heaven's brass. How many of you have ever been there? If you've walked with God very long, you've been there. There are times God just lets you walk by faith. He knows what you're going through. He didn't put the trial. He didn't put the difficulty. He didn't put the test on you. He's working, though, even when you don't feel Him. I'm glad for that because when I get up in the morning, I don't always feel saved. How about you? We don't always feel saved. If we went by feelings, we were not saved right then. But we don't go by feelings. We believe God. We continue to walk by faith. And to do that, we have to believe that God is a very present help. Present help in time of trouble. So here, Martin Luther, he's going through this horrible time. On top of that, his one-year-old son is at the point of death. And he begins to write with his pen, A mighty fortress is our God. That song we sing today, to this day, came during one of the most difficult times in his entire life. And we sing it in faith because it's a powerful song. It shows what the enemy's trying to do. It shows something bigger than the enemy is God. And if you could stand on the fact that God is your refuge, He is your strength. No matter what the enemy's trying to do, greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. The greater one resides inside of you. I want you to point to yourself and say, The greater one's in me. The principal thought in this psalm is that of God's presence, that He's with you right now, whether you feel like Him or not, you take it by faith. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have any troubles today? How many of you got some troubles today? You see, that's why God brings a word to you. He brings a word to fit where you are to speak comfort to you. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. One of His jobs is to bring comfort, but it's also to bring faith because comfort alone doesn't do it. It's good to be comforted by the Holy Spirit, but we need to have hope and faith that it's going to change. Can you say amen? How many of you believe that whatever it is you're going through, any trouble you're going through is about to change? I believe that. The good news is that he is a present refuge. It could be family troubles. We've had those. It could be marital challenges. It could be financial. It could be job related. It could be relational. It hurts terribly when you're close to somebody and all of a sudden that relationship is hindered somehow. Because people have your heart and you have their heart. And we often hurt each other when we don't even expect to do it or want to do it. Isn't that true? But sometimes those things hurt very deeply. Sometimes in your family, there's circumstances that just seem to, to bleed the life out of you in the sense of the natural, all the things you're dealing with. 
but it's good to know that I'm never alone. Do you know one of the greatest things that men, all men and women deal with is loneliness. How many of you know what loneliness feels like? We deal with that. And that's why the enemy comes and tries to break up relationships because relationships, God uses our love for one another and our interaction with each other in the natural sense of the word so that we aren't lonely in life. Somebody's lived with somebody for a lot of years and all of a sudden they go to heaven and they're lonely. And we need to reach out to people that have this. But you know what's beautiful about it? Usually they have a network of friends that come in and make up the difference. Well, we have a network of friends, Father, God, Holy Spirit, and a whole host of angels. Can you say amen? That'll help us through life. This word refuge, listen to this, it's a metaphor for, used for the sanctuary. Refuge, sanctuary. I want everybody to say that. Refuge, refuge. Sanctuary. sanctuary. It's a place of safety. You have a big storm coming and they have storm shelters. They have places where you can come. You're expecting a horrible storm. There's places where you can come where they say that building is safe for you. Come bring your family, come bring your pets, come bring whatever you have, bring it into this place. It's a place of safety. And that's what God is. He's a place of safety. Sometimes we don't feel secure. Sometimes we feel insecure. Sometimes in the middle of the night, you will awaken and you're thinking about the future and the enemy comes and fills in the blanks. But if you'll understand that in the midst of whatever the enemy's trying to do, God is right there. He's a place of safety. He's going to bring you comfort. He's going to bring you help. He's going to turn things around for you. He's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he'd have to repent. Has God not said it? Will he not do it? Hallelujah. I believe he will. Can you say amen? It also carries this, that without God's divine protection, the implication of the imagery is that the victim would surely be at the mercy of his enemies. And God is saying, you're never at the mercy of your enemy. I want you to turn to somebody and say that you, point to them, are never subjected, overpowered, by the, by the enemy, because the enemy is under your feet. Under your feet. Hallelujah. Stomp your feet. Oh, that's a good sound. Choir, you're making a good loud sound. Go ahead, let everybody hear it. Tell somebody, I have present help. Point to somebody, say, you have present help. Point to yourself, say, I have present help. Lift your hand up and say, we have present help. Yes. Hallelujah. Say this, the greater one is living in me and I feel no alarm. See, in the middle of the night, how many of you ever had the enemy awaken you and torment you in the middle of the night or try to? You ought to just lie there in your bed. I learned this a long time ago. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In other words, he's already got my future covered. Yeah, he's going to give me wisdom, how to prepare things, how to do things. I need to be listening to that and following those instructions. But he's going to lead me. He's going to guide me. If I go to make a mistake, he's going to show me it's a mistake. Amen? And right when the enemy's trying to cause me to doubt about tomorrow, God comes in with an assurance. You're in me. I'm in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you abide in me and I abide in you, whatever you ask me, I'll do for you. Hallelujah. In other words, there's a relationship there that you can draw on all the time. It's an ever-living branch. We're an ever-living branch through the power of God that works the trunk of the tree that works out to the branches. Can you say amen? Glory to God. I just want to stop here a minute. I just keep feeling arrested. Right now in the name of Jesus... Yeah, go ahead and receive it. If that's you, at least many of you, go ahead and receive this right now in the name of Jesus. Father, your word is coming to these precious people who simply don't know what they're going to do. 
you're going to show them. I ask you to show them. I ask you to strengthen them. I ask you to minister to them. I ask you to guide them. Jesus, you're the great shepherd. I'm just an under shepherd to you. But I come in your name on behalf of these precious sheep, the sheep of your pasture. And I ask you to give them divine guidance that they'll know exactly what to do. Praise God. Praise God. I believe that. With all of my heart, I believe that. I believe a church, a large church, can be pastored supernaturally. I believe that. And I think following the Holy Spirit is exactly how you do it. I want to talk to you about a story about King Hezekiah for a few moments. King Hezekiah was being threatened by the Assyrians. His kingdom was under siege. He was going through a very, very difficult time in his kingdom. And on top of that, he had a disease that was threatening to kill him. Some kind of a boil. It could have been a cancerous growth. Whatever it was, it was terminal. And here's why. Go with me to, to 2 Kings chapter 20. We're going to talk about a few of these verses. Actually, it, this is replicated in Isaiah 38 as well. But we're going to go to 2 Kings 20 right now. Notice what it says. Verse 1, Now in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Now listen to this. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now that's pretty strong, isn't it? This was a grave situation. Remember this. In Old Testament days, prophets were the mouthpiece of God. The Spirit of God didn't live in them like He does us. When the veil was rent from top to bottom and the Spirit came out of the Holy of Holies, He moved inside mankind through Jesus Christ, through His blood. He cleanses us so that the Spirit can be our habitation and dwell inside us. The Old Covenant, they didn't have that. God spoke through the mouth of a prophet. So if a prophet said, God is speaking through me, and it didn't come to pass, it was not uncommon at all that they would stone him because he had misspoken, saying he was doing it in the name of the Lord. And so Hezekiah being aware of this and Isaiah being aware, look, not only am I given a word from God, I'm giving it to the king. He Hezekiah was in a situation here, but so was Isaiah. If I give the king this word, and nothing comes of it, I'm going to be stoned. So both of them, here is Hezekiah. He's getting a word from a man strong enough in God that he's saying, I'm being the mouthpiece of God. Hezekiah, set your house in order because you're getting ready to die. You say, well, what happened after that? There are some beautiful, beautiful imagery here from the scriptures of what you and I need to do when we face insurmountable situations. Some of you have had that happen to you in a hospital room. The prophet was the doctor. He came to you and he said, under the present circumstances, there's no more I can do for you. In other words, set your house in order for you're going to die. There's people living right now in this very room who were given up to die, but they're living right now in this very room. Amen. And I think we'll see more of them. Can you say amen? But the point is, Hezekiah knew this was serious stuff. The prophet is the mouthpiece of God. God has said, I've got to die. I cannot live. Now notice verse 2. Because Hezekiah understood something. I want everybody to say, Hezekiah knew something that not everybody else knew. See, Hezekiah was a godly king. He'd walked with the Lord. He knew the ways of the Lord. And he knew that God was a present help, a refuge in time of trouble. Notice what he did. Verse 2, then, bless you, then he turned his face to the wall 
and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord. Remember now how have I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Now notice this, and Hezekiah wept sore. We'd say sorely. I remember years ago, I was 40. <laughs> say many, many years ago. And although it had not been diagnosed, I was having a lot of problems with chest pains. I was really struggling, and I thought that I was going to die in the natural. And I remember being on a missionary trip. I went on on my trip. And I remember lying in a, in a hotel room in one of the central Costa Rica, Central America, Costa Rica. I was lying there one night, and I began to talk to the Lord. And I said, Lord, I have three sons. I have a wife. I have a family. I'm not ready to leave. I at least want to raise my sons. Will you give me mercy and let me live and not die? I'll never forget it. I was down there doing his work. I'd gone on to obey what I felt in my heart to do, but I was really struggling. Never was diagnosed, but I knew in my heart that I had to have a touch from God. I knew that. And I was just thinking about it. Now two of them are in Denver serving the Lord. Sean getting ready to start September the 9th with a brand new church and his brother going to help him. I have another son in this house today. I was able to raise my kids and now I get to enjoy my grandkids. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe we can live our lives by faith, and I believe something else, and I know some people get a little, little, they look at me a little strangely when I say this. But I believe God can reveal to you when you're going home. I really believe that. I don't believe it needs to be a surprise to the Christian. I believe we ought to have a sense, and then if you have a sense, you're going home, and it's all right with you, it's all right with the Lord. Just say, praise the Lord, I'm going home in victory. It would be really refreshing to go visit somebody in the hospital that you perceive is going home who would just say, Pastor Reggie, just rejoice with me. I'm getting ready to go see Jesus. Every now and then, somebody does that. Don't pray for me anymore. I'm going home. Do you know it's all right to die? Did you know Paul said to die is gain? What did he mean by that? To live is loss. Let's just reverse that. To die is gain. We sometimes fear death, but death is a beautiful thing for the Christian. When we've lived our life out, I don't think we ought to die prematurely. I don't think we ought to die in our young years. But when you've lived your life and you're getting ready to go to heaven, you ought to just say, come on, Jesus, come send your angel for me. I'm ready to go live in your presence forever. See, just one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But it begins by knowing who He is. It begins by trusting Him. It begins by believing He's got your future covered. It begins by believing that He is your rear guard, your side guard, and in front of you. He is a present help. He's always with you day in and day out. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He is the God of abundance. He is God of more than enough. He is the great I Am, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the God of glory. Can you say amen? And so, so Hezekiah, he understood this. He understood this about God, and he went and he called on him. He turned his face to the wall. Which is what Billy Graham said, I'd have spent more time doing that and less of all this other stuff. He turned his face to the wall and he began to pray and beseech God. You know, Isaiah agrees with this. I believe it's chapter 1, verse 18. It says, come, let us reason together. How many of you reason with the Lord? He said, come to me, just reason with me. That's what I did that night in Costa Rica. I just reasoned with the Lord. Lord, I want to finish my course. I want to raise my kids. You know, I knew it was easy to get a, a new pastor for Family Worship Center, but it wasn't easy to get a new dad. 
I wanted to finish my course. Some of you in this room today, you've kind of given up, but God wants you to finish your course. He wants you to finish your course, not just in the world, not just mundane, not just going through life with motions, not just going through the motions of life, but bless God serving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, so that when you come down to the end of your days, you still are God-centered. You're God-centric. You're Christ-centered. Can you say amen? That's what He wants for our lives, a very present help. He wants to be to you today in this very room. Say out loud, He's a present help. Then it says, Hezekiah wept sorely. I'm sure everything wasn't perfect in his life. He'd worked before God perfectly. But with that, I'm sure he had imperfections. Hezekiah had come to a place where he's either got to die or he's got to let God touch him and change him. So he wept sorely. Every now and then, some of you, you get so caught up with so much, you need to go get in the presence of God and just get a washing. That's what I've been going through for weeks, just a cleansing. I know my preaching's better because my walk with God is better. Do you understand? It can't. The two go together. Amen. I mean, you understand how I'm saying that? I know that because I know what He's feeding me for you. It's not that I haven't sought Him. I've sought Him for a long time. I've spent years seeking the Lord. But there's just been a freshness in me. God, what do you want for this stage of my life? Some of you are there. Some of you are in your second stage or your third stage probably get four or five stages of life. I'm in my fourth or fifth. I don't know. And maybe you don't know, but I do know this. I want to be ready every day, every hour for the rest of my life. And I believe you do too. Hezekiah wept sorely. God, God, I'm coming to you. I need your help. Now let's just follow this along because I want you to notice here, he turned his face to the wall, he prayed unto the Lord, he pled his case, and he wept before God. And, this, and then, here's what we have, that God answered Hezekiah. How many of you love the answer? Notice this, verse 4, and it came to pass, a four, or that means before, Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, turn again. And tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. Wouldn't you say that is, I am, that I am, that I am. I'm a present help to you, Hezekiah. You've turned to me, even though I had said you're going to die. He meant under the very present circumstances, no doubt. Under the present circumstances, without a change, set your house in order, Hezekiah, you're getting ready to die. I've heard thy prayer. Has he heard your prayer? I have seen thy tears. Has he seen your tears? Behold, I will heal thee. Now notice, some folks get thrown by this. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. God is telling him, I'm the Lord who heals you. I am the I am right now, but go three days now. Now notice what 2 Chronicles says along the same line of seeking the Lord. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Not only does he heal bodies, he heals lands. Listen to me, I'm not political. I'm not going to be political. And don't you wrangle a, a, a political statement out of this. But America needs a miracle. We need a healing. We need a genuine healing. If we continue on the path we're on, we're in trouble. But I'm saying in the name of Jesus, we're not going to continue on this path. God's going to turn it around for us. And we're going to head in the right direction. Can you say amen? Say out loud, I believe that. I believe that. Say one more time, I believe that. I believe that. Say out loud with me, America will recover. America will 
I'm not going to be a doom and gloomer. I'm not going to be old speaking against our nation. I'm going to speak on behalf of our nation. I stand here in the name of Jesus with a shield of faith about me. I say America will recover. It will recover. It will recover. It will recover. And then I'm going to say, I told you so. There's plenty wrong in our land, but there's a many a righteous person on their knees before God on behalf of the land of God. Hallelujah. Can you say, I believe God founded America. I believe he'll reestablish America. I believe he'll send revival to America. And I believe America will recover. We may have seven years of lean, but we're going to have seven years of fat. Hallelujah. God's going to come. He's going to bless us. And you need to get yourself in a position to be blessed. Tell somebody, get in position to be blessed. Tell them we're not going to hell in a handbasket. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to accept that. And it could be just like Hezekiah. Set your house in order because you're going to die. No, Lord, please don't. We're not. We're going to turn our face. We're going to repent. He said, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will turn from their wicked and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. Y'all need a little more enthusiasm. You've been listening to all the naysayers. I'm listening to the God-sayer. Hallelujah. He says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Who can lay anything to the chest of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Can you say amen? Yes. Glory. Shout a minute. Exodus 15, see, he said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. If you're going through a sickness, if you're going through a disease, if you're going through something, put that right up on your mirror so that instead of complaining, you read out, I am the Lord that healeth thee. God is the God who heals me. Hallelujah. I am the Lord that heals you. Can you say amen? Now notice. Notice what else. He didn't just heal him. He said, and I will add unto thy days 15 years. And I will deliver thee and this city. Here we go. Personal and the nation. Glory to God. It's right here. I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And I want everybody to say amen. Amen. Now, now here's where we often miss it with God. This is going to be controversial, so perk up for just a minute. I'm almost done. This gets controversial. But stay with me just a minute. Verse 7. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Church, you need to hear this. It's one thing to use your faith, but you must be led by the Spirit. I know when B was going through what she was going, she got into where she couldn't swallow. She couldn't, where breathe. She couldn't breathe. She'd come from the barn. She wasn't being able to breathe. Things were happening inside her from her brain stem that were being crimped. And she was losing mobility, and we saw her going down. Sean and I had a long discussion about it. And, you know, I said, Sean, I'm torn because I know this is a very serious thing, and I know, however, I encourage your mom. That's, how, that's what she's going to do. And I feel the responsibility of it. I've got to know what to do. But the more I prayed, the more I felt like that that's what we should do, that we should take her and have surgery. And today, she swallows normally. Today, she breathes normally. Amen. She still has some headaches, but she's, they're nothing like they were. She's improved amazingly well. And I just know it was the right thing to do because the Lord led us. I remember years ago, Brother Hagin. You know, everybody talked about Brother Hagin being such a man of faith, and he was. But he also balanced that by being led of the Spirit. He was out one time he, on a road trip. You know, he traveled away from his home a lot, off doing evangelistic meetings and ministering. 
And he was doing this at the time. And his wife was home with a, um, um, what we would call a tumor in the throat. They called them gorders back then. And, uh, but uh, anyhow, this thing was growing and it was choking her. And she was having this most difficult time. And, and uh, the doctors had recommended surgery. But she wasn't not getting surgery because she was so much believing God to be healed, although she was doing that. But she was fearful to have surgery, afraid it was going to kill her. So one day, Brother Hagin's lying on his bed praying one afternoon in one of these trips. And the Lord told him to call his wife, tell her to go ahead and have surgery that she would be okay. She would live and not die. He didn't know she was dealing with fear. She only knew that. So when he called and told her that, she did. They removed it and she was perfectly okay. Listen, folks, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be either or. It can be God working with you, leading you. He may lead you to a good spirit-filled doctor. He may lead you to a good medical doctor that's just excellent in his field. It, it, healing comes a lot of ways. Don't relegate it just to one thing. Be open to being led by the Spirit. That's the part that's controversial, but everyone who preaches it also does what I'm saying. They all are led by the Spirit. In other words, I, I know some, some people have said, well, they got healed by the Lord when they actually had surgery. Well, it didn't mean that the Lord didn't heal them up. It just means that they had something removed and God healed them up. I don't think we've got to spend our lives dividing everything up and saying, that's not real faith. Real faith is being led of the Spirit. Follow God. If you have a sickness, let it not be unto death. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What will you lead me to do? He may lead you to the right doctor for the right moment. I'm telling you, B and I prayed and sought the Lord. We did all of the investigative things we could do. We went and saw a couple of doctors and finally we settled on the right one because that's the one we felt comfortable with. That was the one we felt right with. And the result is good. Praise God. Can you say amen? And that's how we, I believe that's how we need to live our lives. We don't need to get so bound up that we feel we've got to sneak and do something because people won't think we've got faith. That's nothing but bondage. And God is not into bondage. He's into freedom. Amen. And I want this place to be free. Yes, we believe God. We first seek the Lord. Don't first go seek everything else. First seek the Lord and see how He leads you. And then once He's led you, obey Him. I'm going to finish with one more miracle. And this is a miracle out of John chapter 2. It's a miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine, and I'm closing with this. Very important that you get this because this is a combination of works. Notice this. Verse 1, the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, saith unto them. Now notice this. Jesus never did a miracle without hearing from the Father. He never did. He said he never did a thing unless he saw his Father do it or heard him say do it. So we know he'd heard from the Father. And here's what he told those men to do. He said, fill the water pots with water. Fill them with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the wine knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is, uh, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. I believe that spiritually too. How many of you believe he's keeping the good wine till now? This... Beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth His glory, and His disciples believed Him. What am I saying? That there's one thing God, there's one situation. They were without water. They had no water. Mary is saying, I want, I want you to take it to Jesus. He's saying, woman, my hour has not come. But Jesus, there's another beautiful little point here. Jesus entered His public ministry under the authority of His mother and His father. Because his father said, fill the pots. His heavenly father communicated to him. His earthly mother communicated to him. He started out his public ministry under the authority of his parents. That is a beautiful, beautiful thought. Kids need to understand that about life. Go out with the blessing of your family. Praise God. I believe that with all of my heart. 
Amen. But this miracle happened as a combination of what God, what was needed, and what God told them to do. And so often that's what we need. Instead of saying it's got to be this way, it's just going to be poof. I don't have to work. I'm just sit home and believe for a job. Somebody's going to call me. I'm just sit by the phone. No, you knock on all the doors you can. Fill out all the apps you can. Do your part and then believe God to do what you can't do. There's a miracle waiting, but you've got to do something to get it. Stand up, everybody, and shout just a minute and give praise. Lift your hands up and give Him praise. I've really felt to bring understanding and some, some insight into these lines, and I just feel like it's working in the Spirit. Lift your hands up and thank the Lord for it.